Hello, this is Dan Nailman. Nice wonder. Welcome to the Nailman Show and more. And it is my pleasure to announce I have three guests on uh, today's show. And uh, first of all, um, the Green Party presidential candidate from 2020, uh, Howie Hawkins, and also uh, Larry Alger from Just News, News Network. Network. Um, thank you. And uh, James, James Rogusky from numerous websites. Uh, welcome to the Nailman Show. Uh, first of all, let's start with questioning of HR1. I know that that's a topic that uh, uh, we wanted to get into today regarding campaign finance. Um, my first question would be to Howie, what is that? <laughs> Well, it's a proposal to have a matching funds program uh, for congressional candidates and changing the existing primary matching funds program for presidential candidates. And first thing I want to say is HR1, the voting rights, ethics, uh, anti-gerrymandering provisions, all that should pass. It's crucial because the Republicans are out there trying to suppress the vote. And if they succeed, and we don't preempt that at the federal level, they're doing it at the state level, uh, they're going to rig elections going forward. And so this minority of right-wingers is going to have the power. So that's number one. But within HR1 is a matching funds program, which is a reform that doesn't reform. It makes it nearly impossible for third-party candidates to qualify, as we have in the past, for presidential primary matching funds, because it increases by fivefold the amount of money we have to raise to qualify in small donations. And I was the only candidate in 2020 to even apply because the major party candidates, because there's a cap on how much private money you can spend. It was about 52 million this year. None of the major party candidates wanted to limit themselves to that. But for us, you know, it would have been a, a nice boost. So we applied. We still haven't got it because they're still documenting our donations. Wow. But uh, at least we qualified. But it took us two years. It was a particularly difficult year. It was anybody but Trump. Really hard for a third party on the left, but we did qualify. You increase that fivefold, you know, we're, we're probably not going to qualify. And then the matching funds sounds good. You know, you're a little candidate, you get a six to one match on these small donations, but that increases the disparities between candidates who are publicly funded by seven times. Suppose you're a presidential candidate, you raise a million dollars to qualify in small donations. So you will get $7 million total. And then you're a candidate who say gets $5 million. You will get $35 million. No, yeah, $35 million in total. So the disparity between the low, lower funded candidate and the higher funded candidate grows from $4 million to $28 million, sevenfold. So that's a problem. And then there are provisions in it that actually increase the power of big donors. For example, the amount that a national party committee can give to a presidential candidate is increased from $5,000 to $100 million. And these Eric, national committees- Can I, can I, can I jump in real quick? What? Can I jump in real quick? I have, you know, first of all, folks, it's a 791 page bill. And on, on page 627, uh, 2A section says, the national committee of a political party may not make any expenditure can, in the connection with the general election campaign of any candidate for president of the United States who is affiliated with such a party which exceeds a hundred million dollars. What does that mean? That means if I may, the, if I may it jump increases in, Howie, from the and, current limit of 5,000 to 100 million. Wow. That's, wow. That's a number. And the big donors give to these national committees. Each party has three of them. A national committee, a House Campaign Committee and a Senate Campaign Committee. This year they could give 109,000 and change to each of those committees. So the big guys can give over $300,000. And if they're like Jeff Bezos and people like that, they give to both parties. So it's over half a million they could give. And that increases the role of big donors. And what campaign finance reform should do is limit uh, big donors, particularly independent expenditures through super PACs which are unlimited. I mean, you can give billions and billions if you want. And there's no provision in the, in the legislation to quarantine that. So 
what I see is a small public campaign financing program only accessible to major party candidates on top of the same old mess of huge private campaign financing that's actually enhanced. So it's a reform that doesn't reform. So yeah. you know, what I'm saying is pass HR1 without the matching funds program and come back to campaign finance reform separately. And what I would advocate there is the clean money, clean elections model, like we use now for presidential general elections, where each candidate gets an equal public campaign grant and they don't run on any privately raised and spend money. And all the presidential candidates use that until Obama jumped out of the program in 2008. And after McCain, none of them have used it because it's only this year is a little over 100 million and they spent billions. Mm -hmm. I mean, that can be corrected by giving them a bigger grant given the realities of campaign finance today. And you can generalize that to congressional elections. The states of Maine, Arizona, and Connecticut already have a program like that. And in fact, Joe Biden co-sponsored a bill for that in 1997 as a Senator. Progressives used to advocate this program of full public campaign financing. The partial campaign financing and matching funds doesn't change things. It, it just adds a little public money on top of the corrupt system we already got. Wow, thanks, Howie. Jim, did you have uh, a point? Yeah, can you guys hear me? Uh, I hope, okay. Yep, you're good. Um, that particular, um, Howie, I'm looking at a uh, graphic that um, is attributed, it, it, it points to your, uh, Howie, uh, I'm sorry, Hawkins 20.us slash HR1. Um, it, it's a graphic that has four bullet points. And um, you know, one of these is the raises party donations limit from 5,000 to 100 million. Those are numbers, that's a number that just makes your head explode and you look at it and you go, holy crap. I mean, this is just egregious. This is just ridiculous. I know you just went over it, but it, it almost requires going over it again. Um, I've tried to read the bill. I, I, I sent Larry the, the, the clip that, that he just, uh, he read to you. Um, there's, there's an aspect of the way these laws are written. Um, and, and there's another component of it where um, on page 621, it's repeal of expenditure limits. And it's just one little sentence. And it just says, we're gonna amend the Election Campaign Act of 1971 by striking subsection B. So it, you know, you read 791 pages and there's one sentence that says, oh, screw this, no, no limits. And, and, and you just go, there's no way the media is gonna harp on just how outrageous this is. Yeah, and that's a that's change from the current public funding program for presidential candidates. I mentioned the cap for primary funding, which was 52 million you could spend privately if you got into the matching funds program. If you accepted that 103 million or whatever it was, uh, general election grant, you could raise and spend no private money on your election. And, you know, Ronald Reagan ran on that, George W. Bush or H.W. Bush ran on that, Bill Clinton ran on that. Um, the problem is the cost of campaigns have escalated so much that the grant is seen as too low by these major party candidates. You know, I could see raising the grant to deal with, you know, the costs of modern campaigns, but to eliminate the cap means you can get public money and raise as much private money and spend it as you want. Even if you're publicly funded. My take, my take on this is it's, you know, this is how propaganda works. You know, you put a couple of good things in there that everybody goes, oh yeah, I gotta have, you know, no gerrymandering, gotta have this, that, and the other thing. You know, let, let people vote, let people register, all that sort of thing. Um, but the, the classic phrase is a poison pill and, and they add these things in there that the media is not gonna present. It's really not for the people, it's definitely for the two parties so the Republicans will make a stink about certain aspects of it, but they're gonna happily um, appreciate all of the money that's gonna come to their party and their candidates. It doesn't set limits where, and, and I think the, the six times match, you did a great job and I'd love to have you repeat it, 
of we're helping the people who don't need help to infinity and beyond when you know if there was some uh, change to it where you know up until a certain point we would help smaller candidates because the argument is if you get a $200 donation small dollar donation um, as a candidate if you get a lot of those and the government was to multiply that times six you know for a total of seven times as much now you're paying attention to small dollar donors and there is a certain logic to it if it was capped but as as you explained earlier and i very much appreciate it, i'd love to have you do it again um it's only helping the rich get richer yeah what is capped is the public funding you can only uh, raise up to 250 million including the six times match so that's about you know i guess what 40 million and then uh, you'll end up with 250 million. You can't get any more public money after that. So they cap the public money, but not the private money. So right. from, have, a, from a you, presidential candidate, that's a certain thing, but for a congressperson or a senator or whatever, it's, it's really, t you, you did a good job of explaining this. It, it's taking the disparity and multiplying it times six or seven, depending upon how you look at it, instead of trying to raise up the smaller candidates, third party, independent, whatever it might be, it's, it's taking the advantage that the duopoly has and just magnifying it. Well, that's a systemic issue yeah. that is, you know, that's part of the whole inequality issue. Uh, so to, to, to recap here, so it, private spending, it eliminates any private spending limits. It raises the party donations from 5,000 to 100 million. It doesn't restrict super PACs or dark money. Um, and obviously it doesn't change Citizens United or the McCutcheon decision. Right. Um, and does, then you mentioned, and then you mentioned something about um, doesn't restrict victory funds. What are, what are victory funds? On the dark money, there is a provision to disclose dark money. There is. Yeah. And that's before you get to matching funds, it's called the disclose act. Um, and so, but the ACLU has a problem with that because some people want to contribute, but they're afraid of getting harassed if it's a controversial issue. So, you know, that's worth debating. I kind of think we need to protect people and, uh, and then people need to stand up for what they believe in. But, you know, that can be debated. Um, and then you raised, the other point was the- uh, The victory funds. Yeah, victory funds. These come out of uh, sort of working through the loopholes and they got magnified by the McCutcheon decision in 2014 and further magnified by a provision in the omnibus spending bill of 2014, which had a lot of crap in it. I got my pension cut because of that bill. Really? But anyway, um, and what that does is enable, you form uh, joint fundraising committees between the candidate committee, the national and state party committees, which increases the limits. You know, right now it's like an individual can only contribute uh, this year or this next cycle, 2,900 for the primary and 2,900 for the general. Um, and then, then there are limits to what you can give to party committees. But when you combine them, then somebody can aggregate that. So like the Biden Victory Committee, uh, contributors could give over 620,000. Wow. And he had fundraisers where sure you couldn't help. get in the door unless you're ready to give 500,000. Exactly. So, so this is a way the big donors get to play. And, and one of the sort of scams in the in the matching funds thing is it reduces what the little people can give. So now it's 2,900 for the for the primary and general, that's uh, 5,800 for the whole election in 2022. But now they're gonna reduce that in this bill to 1,000. You can't give over 1,000 or your donations won't qualify, you know, in 200 or less for the uh, small donor contributions. So to say, look, we're, we're limiting what you can contribute, but that's just the little people. The big people can give, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to the party committees and the victory funds and unlimited millions to the uh, super PACs. So, so going forward, what, what is that? What are the ramifications for any kind of third party? I know there's a people's movement for a third party. I know there's um, people are talking about that, you know, a, a cooperative kind of party democracy at work. Uh, the DSA is organizing like brain, uh, gangbusters right now. Um, 
what does that mean for any kind of possibility of an additional party to challenge Democrats and Republicans going forward? Well, I think we're going to have an opportunity to work on campaign finance reform because the Democrats aren't going to kill the filibuster. So HR1 is probably going to be dead unless, you know, Biden and Schumer really play hardball with Manchin and Cinema. Otherwise, you know, they're basically keeping the filibuster hands the power back to the Republicans who can rule from a minority position. And no legislation is going to get through that the Democrats want. So I think that's where we're at. So we have probably have time to try to get back to the full campaign financing model that we were pushing back in the 90s. And, you know, those states I mentioned and the presidential general election campaign funds used. Um, but I think the game changer is the movement for ranked choice voting. Because right now, progressives, when they confront an election like we just had, they say, I got to vote for that centrist Biden to stop that far right Trump. And progressives get marginalized. And it's not just those outside the Democratic Party like me, it's those inside. You know, That's AOC right. and them don't have any leverage That's because right. the corporate leadership says, where are you going to go? You know, you ain't going nowhere. We got you in our pocket. So AOC wants to get on the Energy and Commerce Committee because it deals with Medicare for All and the Green New Deal. And she puts in her application. So the leadership finds Kathleen Rice, a conservative Democrat from Long Island, and runs her against AOC. And the Policy and Steering Committee of the Democratic Caucus, which makes those decisions, voted 46 to 13 for Rice over AOC. That kind of tells you the balance of forces. They don't have to respect the squad and the other progressives because what are they going to do? They're not going to go to the Republicans. And because of this plurality voting system, they're not going to come to the Greens. But ranked choice voting, I think, is an idea whose time has come. We got it in six more cities in the state of Alaska for a total of 38 cities in two states. And now there are movements in 20 states right now. I've never seen so much movement on this. And if we can get that enacted, local, state, and eventually national level, then people can vote, you know, who are progressive can vote for the Greens without worrying about the Republicans because they can rank the Democrats second. So I think that's, that's what we can win during Biden time. We can advance on. But it's still going to require uh, what a lot of people are saying, uh, push Biden to the left. It's still going to require that. It's still going to require, I think, some kind of a of That's a not going to happen. You know, Biden is who Biden is, and he's got 40 odd years of doing what he does. You know, it's a, it's a pipe dream. You're not going to push Biden left. So, Howie, what do we need to do for H.R. 1 to what, what provisions do we need to kill or modify? Well, the matching funds program, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but it, there's a it's it's. I think it's title four of the uh, campaign finance section. And that's where it talks about the matching funds program. There's also a pilot voucher program where voters who ask for a voucher, you don't get one automatically, but if you ask for it, you have $25 to spend on your favorite candidates. Really? The problem is it's token. It's so small, it won't make any difference. Yeah. Uh, the maximum funding over 10 years is I think three, 300 million or 30 million. Um, no, you can't spend more than 10 million in any state. It'll only happen in 10 states. So in a large state, you know, it's just not going to make a difference. Um, Seattle has that. And, uh, you know, they want to do a pilot project. I mean, if you're going to do it, do it. Um, so anyway, that's included in there too. Um, Howie, let me refresh your memory. I'm looking at your good article on counterpunch.org. Um, and if I can ask you just a couple of specifics in, in, in regards to what Larry was asking, um, from a presidential <laughs> candidate standpoint, um, they made that they, they increased the requirement to get matching funds. They multiplied it times five. It was a hundred thousand total where you had to have, you know, from 20 States, 5,000 each in $250 or less. Okay. Now they jacked it up to 500,000. The issue, and I hope I can explain this clearly, is they wanna help bigger candidates with this setup. 
it's not about helping smaller candidates get matching funds. The bigger candidates have been avoiding this because it's too small for them. They want even more. But do I understand it correctly? They, they wiped out the limit now in, in terms yes. of- Okay. So if this, gonna, is, this yeah, is for President clearly Trump, right. helping big guys. It's not helping little guys, it's hurting them. Right, right. So that's on a presidential level. Now, it also says in your article, um, congressional candidates would also have a matching funds program for the first time, okay? They'd have to raise um, at least 50 grand uh, from at least a thousand people of $200 or less, which sounds good. It sounds like, oh. Sounds great. Get, it sounds great, okay? And a lot of people are doing that uh, or, or, or presenting it that way. It sounds like, oh, um, go look at the small dollar donor who's gonna give you $200 and we'll add 1200 on top of that. So your $200 donation turns into 1400, but there's no cap. And so there's a, there's a bottom limit that you can't participate unless you get more than a thousand donors. So they're really cutting out the little guy to just multiply the advantage that the bigger guys have. And there's no upper upper cap. So, you know, just first thing that comes to mind, you know, and I know it's it's a presidential thing, but you know, somebody like Bernie, Bernie got millions of donations. Scale that down to a Democrat or a Republican who changes their focus. Um, you know, Trump got a lot of small dollar donations, but look at a, um, a, a, a a Green Party, uh, you know, I know Green Party candidates running for Congress in Pennsylvania. It's going to be hard for them to get a thousand two hundred dollar um, donors. They they may get it, but for the Democrat or the Republican that they're opposing, they're going to they, they could go so far past that and get six times, and and you're leaving the little guy in the dust. And so there's the presentation. And very much to my disappointment, um, Kim Iverson did a big video on this yesterday and she fell for it. It's like, oh, this is great. It's gonna get, make, make politicians um, look to little guys to get $200, okay? Yeah, but it's just gonna multiply their advantage as, as Howie says, times seven. So Howie, if you can clarify, it sounds good, but how would that really hurt the smaller um, candidates? Well, in Arizona, where they have this uh, full public campaign finance program, uh, you have to raise, I forget the numbers right now, but it's, it's about a, proportionally, it's about a 10th of what they're proposing for congressional candidates. If you scaled up the Arizona qualifying threshold to congressional districts, it would be actually $4,000. I say, let's make it 5,000. And uh, so it's about 10%. Now, if, it, if the program started at uh, $5,000, you rate $5,000 in small contributions, then you can start getting those small contributions matched. That, uh, that would be reasonable. And it would let you know, upstart candidates, third party, even within the major party. You know, I'm looking at the New York primary uh, for mayor and you know there are two women of color running, Diana Morales and uh, Maya Wiley, and all the guys have got the you know qualified for matching funds there, and these two women have not, even though they're among the front-running candidates. Hmm. Um, so you know, imagine Shirley Chisholm, you yeah. know when she started out, she wouldn't qualify under this system, you know, in the presidential thing, and you know maybe not for Congress, so. You know, if you come from a community that doesn't have a lot of money and your contacts, uh, you know, your first contributors are not likely to have a lot of money, uh, you're at a disadvantage. Whereas you're in a major party, they have these massive lists, which you can get access to by making a few agreements with the, you know, national party on use of the database. And then, then you have access to all these donors. For upstarts or the Green Party, our lists are small compared to the major parties. Uh, it just makes it logistically very difficult. You, you know, if, if you're a green congressional candidate, I mean, fifty thousand is would be a good uh, fundraising operation for the whole campaign, let alone small donations and time to qualify 
for matching funds. That's early true. On. Yeah, you know, two days before the election, you finally get over the threshold to get matching funds. Big, big deal. It, it, to, to summarize what, what Larry, like what could, what could be changed? Um, you know, if there was an amendment that said, hey, lower the threshold to qualify, yeah. but cap the total amount so that there's a range where you're helping um, legitimate candidates, but you're not helping the people who don't need help, you know, ad infinitum. They just yeah. keep plowing in the $200 donations um, and, and, and you're just letting them lap the field. It, it, it seems like it needs a lower threshold and a cap at some point to stop the runaway of, of the big parties. But it, but how actually would you achieve that? I mean, amendment to the bill. Yeah, you know, but how would you get that amendment? I mean, we still have to have we still have to put pressure on the people that would be in that process to even introduce that idea. As we've seen with the fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage, Joe Biden gives lip service to it over and over and over again, and and the the squad could defend it and could could make it happen. But nobody wants to really, at the, up to this point, wants to do that. They don't want to put pressure on the on the, on where the pressure needs to be so that that can happen. And it, this should be a common sense, easy thing to do, but it's obviously not when you step, have certain number, powers in play. Step number one is what we're doing right now, which is just and thank you, Howie, because you raised my awareness with the stuff that you put out there. Absolutely, I, I appreciate you having done the analysis that you did on your site and on Counterpunch because it, it made me wake up, okay? Mm -hmm. And, you know, other um, alternative media people are just regurgitating the, the propaganda. They're not doing the analysis. They're not thinking, hey, wait a minute. If we lower the threshold and we put a cap on it, now we're actually doing what the propaganda is making us think it's doing. Whereas right. the actual bill is not in alignment with the presentation the bill is not for the people, it's for the politicians and for the parties. That's right. Well, it it's always awareness. is, they're always self-serving. That, that's, that's the whole idea, right? The, the position I've taken on amendments is just cut the matching funds section out. Uh, that's simple, it's understandable, it's a clear demand. And I think we should have campaign finance reform legislation that's separate. And then we can argue about whether it should be partial public funding with matching funds or full public funding with equal grants. Um, and also in order to make the program not just voluntary, but mandatory, we need an amendment to the US constitution. There's a we the people amendment that uh, hadn't been introduced to this Congress, but it will be um, that would basically end the Supreme Court imposed doctrines that artificial corporations have constitutional rights like natural persons and that oh. money is speech, not property. Well, and Citizens it, United. Well, it would overturn Citizens United, Buckley v. Vallejo, McCutcheon, and a whole lot of other decisions on the corporate personhood going back to the 19th century. And what that would enable the public to do is fully regulate election campaign finance and enact a full public campaign financing program if that's what we want. So I think that's, that's the longer term goal. Because without that, you know, there's no way to stop, for example, unlimited contributions of super PACs for independent expenditures. And they, they'll, that will continue to dominate even if we get the best public campaign finance program we can conceive of. It'll swamp, you know, the public money. Yeah, till, till Citizens United is history, you know, it's, we're just swimming upstream against, against the uh, current. And that's why organizing is so important. And there's a, a lot of organizing that's going on um, with DSA right now. And I see a lot of potential there in growing numbers to put pressure for whatever issue, um, not just electoral politics. There's all kinds of things. Uh, there's right. a healthcare for all. I'm connecting with people even uh, with DSA in New York City on, on uh, Medicare for all, healthcare for all. So this is what we have to do is to, in my view, we have to build a movement. We have to bring, we have to create coalitions and bring people together to put pressure because that's how we got to the New Deal, for instance, in the 1930s. We have that as, a, as an example that does work, but there has to be pressure from below 
coming from multiple groups, multiple coalitions. And I think this can be one of the issues too. And ranked choice voting, isn't there some forward movement on that, Howie, in, in New England, like in Maine, the state of Maine? Maine, yeah. Yeah, Maine's adopted it. Burlington, Vermont just adopted it for their city elections. Cool. In, in an election last week. Um, yeah, that's that's got momentum. You know, our problem with Congress is they don't listen to the left because they don't have to. And so, you know, they're Green's in Sarbanes district. He's the prime sponsor of HR1. They've been trying to reach him for weeks. They get no response. Uh, I'm on going on a podcast. Podcaster wanted Sarbanes to come on. She can't even get the staff to respond. So, you know, we're kind of on the outside looking in. And uh, the thing about the New Deal, not only was there a new labor movement, you know, with the sit down strikes and, you know, uh, disrupting big business and, right. you know, forcing Roosevelt's hand, there was also a third party movement. There was a movement for a labor party. That's right. You know, the UAW and these other unions were saying we want a labor party in 36. The Progressive Party in Wisconsin and the Farmer Labor Party in Minnesota between them had 13 members of Congress, four senators, two governors. And then you had socialists and labor or labor farmer people elected to all kinds of city councils and county boards all over the country. And Roosevelt was very worried about that. The Democratic National Committee did a, a national poll, one of the early ones that Gallup did. And it showed that if this Labor Party ran, Roosevelt would lose. So he made moves. That's why we got what they call the Second New Deal, which included Social Security, uh, the Works Progress Administration of Public Jobs, CCC. the National Labor Relations Board, or Act, which you know legalized unions, basically. Um, that was the progressive part of the New Deal. And it was yeah. a combination of movement and the threat of a third party. Okay, hey. I know we're we're getting close to wrapping up. And Howie, how do people get a hold of you? Well, I have a website. It's HowieHawkins.us, and okay. it's uh, I'm not running for president, but we kept the committee alive and for the next cycle. Well, we, Call we, it Howie Hawkins for the future, right. so we can continue working on these issues. Right, and we need to build the bridges of coalition. That's right. Find common ground between everybody so that we can stand up for what's right and and dan how do how do people find your work and you can find me uh on youtube uh the now man show on the aurora channel of course and then there's also a grassroots channel just called uh, the now man show if you're streaming around the world you can watch it in real time each week it starts the broadcast week on Saturdays at 7.30 a.m. and 7.30 p.m. Pacific time, uh, the Royal Channel in the LA area and beyond, cable access, but it's also streaming on Roku, uh, Apple TV and Fire TV. So oh. we're all over the world in real time. So uh, that's how you'll see this show. And you can reach me at NiceWander, N-I-S-W-A-N-D-E-R on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, even TikTok. I mean, anywhere we can reach people, um, reach out to me and, and uh, if you want to be on the show, we can talk some more. And Howie I, uh, and Jim, uh, let's have Jim uh, get your contact information and then we can uh, wrap this up. Um, I do too many things. So just go to jamesrogowski.com, <laughs> J-A-M-E-S-R-O-G-U-S-K-I.com. Um, I would like to ask Howie a question. It sounded like you were about to as well. Um, just for clarity, we, we went over this, but in regards to presidential elections and this HR1 bill, the current situation is such that um, candidates can receive matching funds if they limit how much private funding they receive. And since Obama, they've said, screw it, we can get way more private money so we'll pass on the public funding match, which is a one-to-one -one match, I believe. But this bill eliminates that. So now you're gonna have presidential campaigns if this bill was to pass with unlimited private funding that gets matched by public funding. Am I correct, Howie? I'm, I'm looking- Yeah, the limit is on spending. You can only spend so much on your campaign with your private funds if you accept public money. And this bill wipes that limit out, my understanding. Yes. 
Yes. That's crazy. This is not getting money out of politics. This is doubling it's, down. It's doubling down on it and creating the illusion because of eliminating gerrymandering or, or let's say um, a cross check or whatever, if that can't be used anymore, it sounds good. It, you know, that, but that doesn't mean that it's accomplishing the goal that they want people psychologically to think that it is. And, and that's, 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 the, that's how the uh, uh, inequality is set up in our whole system. I mean, in the United States, 20% of uh, Americans own 80, 86% of the wealth now. And, you know, that's, that's insane. I mean, people should be demanding uh, change, like now. How much and, Larry, why, don't, why don't you give your contact info? Okay, I'm Larry Alger with justicenewsnetwork.com. And I want to thank Dan, Howie, and Jim for this informational this is better information than i've seen on anybody else i appreciate it howie thank you yes thank you howie and jim and and uh, and larry also it's great working with you guys and i have one more question um and howie the uh details about the green new deal are still on your website is that correct people want to go look at that yeah we have the most developed plan and budget anywhere in the country yep and I, you can read it on the website and all the details that include you know a universal health care a ubi a jobs jobs programs everything you know short-term and long-term solutions again thank you gentlemen thank you for being on the now man show always stay present in the moment now all right thanks howie yeah thanks howie thank appreciate that thanks howie. that's howiehawkins.us right howiehawkins.us